Good morning. I'm Glenn Hargett with the city of Jacksonville, and among the other things that I get to do is to work with tourism and great people like this that are assembled in this room today. I want to welcome you to the Jacksonville Youth Council's Youth Center, and today we get a, a real in-depth look at um, who stays in Jacksonville lodging facilities. And we're excited to be able to have such a distinguished panel here that are with us as it was. And so we want to just start a moment with some introductions. But first, I want to introduce the chairman of the Jacksonville Tourism Development Authority, His Honor um, Michael Lazara. Thank you, Glenn. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you guys for being here with us this morning. It's a very special day, and I know it's Monday, and we're probably all dragging a little bit. But I ask for you to be excited this morning and to pay attention. I want to thank our distinguished panel today for being with us. Representative Phil Shepard has joined us this morning. Commissioner Mark Price and Commissioner Bennett, thank you for being here this morning. We look forward uh, to this report and to our distinguished panel. We have with us today Judy Randall. Say hello, Judy. Thank you for being with us. She's uh, president of Randall and Travel Marketing, which I believe she's going to be doing the presentation this morning. And we also have Marlise Taylor. Thank you for joining us today. She is the, the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina and Visit NC, Director of Research. We have with us Lynn Minges. Thank you for being with us, Lynn. Uh, as you know, Lynn is with the North Carolina Restaurant and Lodging Association. We also have Peter Bow Bowden. Is that correct? Bowden. Okay. And Peter is with the Columbus Convention and Visitors Bureau. Thank you for joining us. And we also have Chris Cavanaugh. Thank you, Chris, for joining us. And he's with Magellan Strategy Group. So without further ado, we'll get started. And again, we're very excited to have you all with us today. And I know it'll be a very informative session. Thank you. Glenn. Judy. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let me first give you kind of a context of what we're doing here so you know what to expect. This session is going to take about an hour and a half or so of us talking, and then we want to have about 30 minutes if we can squeeze in that much for discussion with you. Um, I'm going to be going over with you the lodging survey study that we did here in Jacksonville. We sent a survey to all the hotels. They filled it out. We got 72% response, which is incredibly good. So we're very happy with that. So we've got some really good, fresh data to bring to the table. And how many of you are in the hotel business? Raise your hands if you are. Okay. They know this language that the rest of you may not know. That language is called the STAR Report. Smith Travel Research is a company that handles the data for all the major hotel chains across the globe. So they are the go-to source. All the hotels have contracts. Every hotel chain out there, I believe, has ho contracts with Smith Travel Research, and they give Smith Travel Research individually their hotels. Each hotel gives them their numbers on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And then Smith Travel Research gives them what the industry refers to as the STAR report. And in that STAR report, they take their numbers and the four or five hotels most closely like them in their area, so they look at their comp set. So one of the things in this industry hoteliers kind of get a bit annoyed with is that most people don't understand their business. So once you learn to speak STAR report, you can actually have a meaningful conversation <laughs> with the hotelier because that means you understand what they go through. So this report is based on their input to us plus buying that STAR report for Jacksonville. So you're going to get some data that's probably never been put together before for you guys, and it should be pretty meaty stuff. In addition to that, I have, I, I, I am so thrilled to be on the panel with these people. I mean, this, this literally is a dream team, in my opinion. Marlise, what she does is all the research for the state of North Carolina. So she can show the STAR report for you compared to what it's like with other regions around North Carolina, and that's what she's going to be talking about. And also, she knows all the trends, all the visitor behavior, and everything else, and has been doing it for... A long time. Uh, this, I mean, I, I, I literally knew her in college, and she's got teenage, teenagers and people in high school now, so it's, uh, it's incredible. And then Lynn Mingus. Who uh, hired me. Who hired yeah. her. I mean, this, this is really an incestuous uh, uh, little community up here. 
Lynn um, has been in the tourism industry a while too, and she used to run. How long did you run the North Carolina? Oh, I was there 20, years. 20 years that she right. ran North Carolina, the whole tourism marketing enterprise, and now she's running North Carolina Hotel and Motel Association. So she brings a lot of meat to the table. Peter Bowden, who's next down the line, runs Columbus, Georgia, home of Fort Benning. So needless to say, he's and he's been doing how, how long you been there? We've all been we're all older than dirt. So. Eighty six years. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's been close to twenty. So Peter brings a lot to the table in terms of watching how a military base because again, much like you, they're dependent upon military as well. And they've had to suffer through some of the same kinds of changes and learning how to build other segments and that kind of thing. So he brings a wealth of, of knowledge to the table. Chris Cavanaugh um, has worked with all of us. I mean, we've been, all been in the same industry now, lo these many decades. And Chris spent 20 years something with Biltmore not quite, but, but Close it, seemed, enough. it seemed like 20 yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Biltmore, as you know, is one of the largest attractions in the country. So they have over a million visitors. And just to contra a year, to contrast that for you, Yellowstone only gets about three and a half million. So, you know, Biltmore is huge. So they, of course, they had money too. So they were always the envy of the rest of us because mm -hmm. they could actually do things. Mm -hmm. So he brings a whole lot of top level science of how to do marketing and how to do studies so that's sort of the context and if uh, you have in front of you a handout um, and I will take you through this handout not page by page but kind of take you through some of the highlights of this so feel free to flip along with us if you'll look at page one of this the first two pages are a summary of the report and just so you kind of understand again the the universe that we're dealing with you have here right now 27 active hotel properties. Now once the Holiday Inn, I mean the Hilton Garden Inn comes online, that'll be 28. And then there's one that is currently closed but may reopen, so that number changes. And you have about 2,300 hotel rooms in addition to the, uh, that those properties represent. So that's where you are. And again, we had response from 72% of those rooms for this survey uh, and higher than that for the STAR report. So the numbers that you're seeing are, I mean, they're, they're over 95% reliability. We've got solid data here. If you look in the middle of that page one, one of the first things we do when we're looking at a community like you is to look at what kind of lodging you have. And we're looking at it by age and by type, type meaning um, economy, mid-scale, upscale. And what you want to see, if you look at that middle of the page, you see that you've got about 48% of your hotel rooms here were built since 2000. That's great, and that's fairly unusual. Generally, we run into more older properties than newer properties, so you've got a good inventory to work with a product inventory and if you look over beside it at the class of lodging properties uh, about 45 percent are in the economy class that's very average uh, normally with places that we work with it's about 50 percent is in the economy range and then you're lucky if you have what you have in the upscale so you've got the right product you're not suffering from the kind of hotels you have at all. Um, that chart that's at the top is the STAR uh, report numbers, and I'm just going to read across the top of those columns so you know what each one of those columns means. Um, the year is the year of the STAR data. Occupancy means how many rooms, uh, and, and for this little exercise here, I want you to pretend you have a hotel, okay? You've got a hotel, and it's got 100 rooms in it. So if we say that you had occupancy of 50%, that means last night half of those hotel rooms were rented and half weren't, right? So that's what occupancy refers to. ADR is average daily rate. So let's say you sold each one of those rooms last night for $100 each. So your ADR would be $100, right? Okay. Now here's the tough one, Revpar. 
And this is, this is where you learn to speak hotel language. If you can speak RevPAR, they know you know what you're talking about. Otherwise, you're just, you know, you'll be talking to them and they're like, they don't understand our business. Okay, you have 100 hotel rooms. Last night you rented half of them. Your average daily rate was what? $100. Because you rented 50 of those rooms for $100 each. But 50 <coughs> rooms sat empty that you still had to clean, pay taxes on, have staff, blah, blah, blah. So your revenue per available room, RevPAR, if it was $100 and you had 50% occupancy, what was your rev par? Bingo. Now you can speak star language, okay? Supply means simply you had how many hotels multiplied by 365 days a year. So that's what supply is. And then demand is the occupancy figure of that, the number of actually booked <coughs> hotel nights out of that. And then revenues, of course, or how much money you made from that. So as you're looking at this, um, we'll go through the charts that actually look at it, but just briefly looking at that chart on page one, if you look at occupancy and you look at ADR and you look at RevPAR, what can you tell me about Jacksonville? Huh? We have room for improvement. Yeah. <laughs> are, the numbers, are the numbers going up or are they going down? Going down. Yes, and right. Well, and, and hence the reason for the study. Lynn, you started to say something? No, no. no oh, okay, okay. Um, so, so, you know, I mean, it is, the numbers are not going in the trend we want. All right, if you look at page three, um, this is really just our inventory <coughs> list, our sheet. And so every hotel that's active and even the inactive ones are on here. It's got the number of rooms. It's got the class. Interior, exterior refers to the corridors. That matters uh, for some uh, segments that you're selling to. Sports, for instance, any youth groups require an interior corridor um, just for safety reasons and so they can control the little rascals. So that's, uh, you know, they have to have the interior corridors. And then you have the ones that report to STAR. They don't have to report to STAR, but if they want to participate in the STAR data, they do. And then you have the open date, uh, the thing that says AFF date, that means effective date. So if they were built or when they were last major renovation, that's what that date refers to. And then responded to TRM, that's Randall Travel Marketing, which means they responded to the survey that we sent to them. Uh, flipping on over, if you look at the page five, this is where we really just looked at um, uh, the age of them, and you can see this is where that chart came from on the front page and lists them all, so we'll just keep going. And page six is the same thing. It's uh, dealing with the class. Um, on page seven is where we start digging a little bit deeper into the Smith Travel Research, and you see the, uh, the your trend compared to the <coughs> national trend. And of course, yours doesn't look as good as the national trend, so that tells you that there's something going on here that's not typical. So that's where you start looking at it and going, hmm, it's not the national economy, you know, it's us um, that is down, so that's not what you want to see. On page eight, you can look at it month by month. And you have a pretty typical pattern here. If you look at the chart on the top of page eight, July is your best month around here. You do well in the summer. Uh, December is your worst month, and January and February is right behind that. So winter is your challenge. Uh, so that tells you there's something happening here in the summertime that's better than in the winter. And you start thinking, hmm, what might that be? <laughs> well, there's an ocean about uh, 30 miles away. and. You've got a lot of factors, I mean, in addition to the visiting friends and relatives and the kind of people we'll talk about in just a minute, the kind of visitors that actually come and stay here. But this is your pattern, and it's not totally atypical, but it tells you more than anything, in marketing, the most likely new customer you're ever going to get is one who looks just like the happy, satisfied customer you have now. So if you can, you start with filling up your summer, in other words, more, because that's the low-hanging fruit. That's the easy 
ones to convert. And then you work your way to the hardest. So that it kind of goes against uh, uh, typical thought patterns to think that way, but that's why you want to know where you are and what you should be targeting first and second and so forth. Um, on page nine, you've got the occupancy by the week. Now, just by looking at that chart on the bottom of page nine, when do we need more business? Bingo, you're learning how to read this stuff. Um, weekends are doing better than weekdays, and we do have places that they do better on the weekdays and not so well on the weekends. So that if you're not doing well on the week, if you're doing better on the weekdays and not on the weekends, you might have a very active business travel segment or meetings or something like that. So looking at this, it's like, well, how do we fill up those weekdays? Uh, and that's a little bit tougher to do than filling up because if it were weekends, we'd just do leisure marketing, right? To fill those up. So when you've got weekdays that are the issue, right now your number one most occupied night is Saturday night, followed by Friday. Now fortunately, you do have uh, your military, uh, uh, <coughs> what are they, graduations that happen on Tuesday. Um, so Tuesdays and Wednesdays tend to be pretty good for you, and that's a godsend. Uh, but as you've seen in the last couple of years, that has waned. You know, it's not something that you can absolutely count on to happen every year. Turning to page 10, you see the supply and demand chart, and you always hate to see that because it's like, gosh, all those empty rooms sitting there. Um, but that's what your supply and demand looks like. And then the page beside it is your average daily rate and your revenue per available room or RevPAR. Um, and right now, your uh, the RevPAR was hovering around $44 per room during the Great Recession. But you, you don't ever really want to see RevPAR below $50 a room. I mean, that's kind of the, all you hoteliers in the room can back me up, but I mean, when until it gets to $50 a room, whoever owns that place is on you every day. <laughs> because I mean, you have to make enough money to keep the, the place operational and functional. So $50 tends to be kind of the dividing line of how, how much they, they nag and scream. Um, and then you, of course, want it to go up from that. Uh, flipping on over, you have the lodging revenues. Um, and this is where you really see the effects of Camp Lejeune and uh, the, uh, the deployment that you have here. Page 13, this is new information for you. This is the survey that we sent to all the hoteliers. We asked them, of all the people that stay in your rooms, what percentage fall into these different categories? And this is very beneficial for you to see what's going on market-wide so you know how your particular property might compare. And looking at this, um, your largest market segment is military, no surprise. And that's similar you know, for Peter, too, uh, down in Columbus, Georgia. Business is about 27%. Business is a little bit higher, typically, in other places that we work with. It's usually around 30, at least a third, maybe a little bit higher than that, if you're in a... a if you're a destination along a major interstate near a big city, then it's probably going to be 45%. So seeing it down at that level <coughs> tells me that you don't have that much business travel, but as your population grows and as your other market segments go up, the volume of that will go up in probably the percentage too. And then you have 21.2% that are leisure visitors. Does that surprise you? Kind of expect to have the leisure market. Um, you do have a lot of folks that are coming here for deployment, either when they go away or when they're coming back and bringing families. There's a lot of what we call VFR, visiting friends and relatives, uh, that are coming in and staying, as well as transient and people that are coming here because um, because you have, again, a beach 30 minutes away and that kind of thing. Um, I think I've covered them all, except for sports. Sports is 2.6%. Does that number surprise you? You thought it'd be higher, didn't you? Uh, bear in mind when we're talking percentages like this, 1% is a lot of rooms. So again, if you take that 2,500 rooms, 2,500 rooms, 
and multiply it by 365 days of the week for the occupancy, and then you look at how full those rooms are. Anyway, when you do the math and work it out, that 2.6% is actually about 13,000 rooms. So it's a good quantity, even though the percentage is small. Typically, though, for a community like you, where we like to see sports is about 10%. Um, if you're at 10%, that means you probably do have good sports facilities and you're doing a good job of recruiting. Now, I've got another client just outside of New Orleans, St. Tammany Parish. That's where Covington is. And they've got fabulous facilities, but their sports percentage is still right around 5%. Why? They built these fabulous sports facilities, but the only people that use them are the locals. The locals filled up the capacity, if you would, and so they don't, they're not able to bring in groups from outside because all the locals and people that live close by are using those facilities. So it's always a balancing dance. You have to figure out you know, if you're building facilities, who is it that you're targeting? How are you gonna bring those people in? Mm -hmm and fill them up because you do want your locals to have access to it, but you're, if you're doing that strategically to grow tourism, you have to pay attention to what's going on and how you're doing it. So that's the, the picture of who stays in your hotel. And again, as I was talking about earlier from the marketing standpoint, the most likely group you want to go after is the ones that you're already doing pretty well with. Now, you can't do that for the deployed military, for the Marines unfortunately, um, but you can do that for leisure, for sports, for meetings, for groups, for some of these other segments, and that's what you're, you're looking at. Um, on page 14, your walk-in, if you look about the middle of the page, it says walk-in lodging. We ask the hotel you know what percentage of your guests just walk in without an advance uh, reservation, and it's almost 30%, and that's high. Um, that means that you're probably getting a lot of people that are traveling around, maybe going to the beach, or maybe they're coming down to visit friends and relatives, or it could be military people too that are going in without an advanced reservation and staying. And usually when it's that high and it's a military town, I assume that that's military uh, related. Travel parties with and without children, uh, about 61% or 62% of your visitors do not have children. Nationally, it's like 75% that do not have children in the party and only 25% that do, mainly because kids aren't available uh, except during the summer and weekends to be able to travel. They're in school or whatever. So you're a little bit higher on the kid um, percentage. And again, I would assume that that is probably because they're bringing family members to see their marine before or after deployment, as well as the fact that you've got a beach. So, you know, you're a good alternative to that. Uh, room tax, um, taxes charged, sales tax and occupancy taxes charged on rooms down at the bottom, page 14. And your non-taxable, in other words, the amount of government <laughs> business <laughs> that you've got is close to 30%, so that's because you're a military town. On page 15, we looked at your leisure feeder markets. Now, these are not your total feeder markets, but just for your leisure segment. And most of them tend to be close drive-in distance, which is not totally weird. Um, on page 16, there's just some, some kind of like what other people see when they're looking at Jacksonville, some information from Sperling. I put this in mainly to look at how you compare with other communities in North Carolina. And particularly in North Carolina, we look at retirement because we've got too many Yankees moving down here. Um, <laughs> I live in Charlotte, and right now, the last numbers I saw from the Charlotte Chamber of Commerce said that 66% of our population in Charlotte is not from the Southeast. So it's a huge retirement mecca coming down here. And of course, that means you want your slice of that pie. Uh, that's good money when they come in, so you want to know where you are. On page 17, you're looking at your deployment figures, and that's a sad looking chart. Um, so you can see that it's, <laughs> that's nothing else you can say. It's like, oh, <laughs> from 20,000 down to 3,000 in 
you know, the good news is things are going pretty well around the world. The bad news is it's, it's definitely affecting you. Um, on page 18, we look at population growth and how you're doing. You've got about 82,000 people here now. And basically, you're poised for population growth. And one of the things you need to realize is how much <coughs> Wilmington and New Bern have done in the way of attracting retirees. You know their populations have grown. And, I mean, they have worked it and been on it, and they are the recipient of that growth, right? Where are you? Right smack in the middle. So as they continue to grow, you're sitting there potentially benefiting from their efforts. <coughs> Does that make sense? In other words, you become the slightly more affordable, yet close to all the amenities, destination. So this is something for you to keep an eye on and keep looking at how you are positioned and how that is growing for you because that is definitely something that you can hook your wagon to. Um, on page 19 um, and the rest of the, the rest of the pages uh, are our recommendations and I'm just going to run through these quickly and then we'll come back and talk about them more after the other folks have talked. Um, sports are a great market for you to go after, but you have to be careful. You have to manage sports so that it is profitable for you in tourism and something that you can balance out. You do have the right inventory for it, and you're in a good place. What you have to compete with, though, one thing you have to understand is sports people have gotten smart. They've learned that they can ask for incentives. So you're competing against some bigger dogs in the marketplace, Wilmington, Jacks, I mean Fayetteville, different communities that go after sports in a big way and spend a lot of incentive money bringing those groups in. So you have to pretty much zig where they zag. What you want to determine is the most profitable, the ones that spend the most, the most profitable underserved sports segments. Let me tell you a quick story that some of you have heard to you're sick of it, but it's a great <laughs> illustration. Let's say you're recruiting a boys' basketball team or a girls' basketball team. You bring in the boys' basketball team. They put at least two boys in every room. I can go into a hotel and look down that hallway, and if it's lined with pizza boxes, we got us a sports group in town. You know it's going to be a miserable night. <laughs> they don't leave the room. <laughs> The hoteliers know they trash the room, they dye their hair green, they're a mess. <laughs> Not profitable. Let's say instead you bring in a girls high school basketball team. You automatically double the number of rooms you sell because every girl brings an average of two and a half family members with her when she comes. The boys, they don't want them. The families will stay home. But the girls, the families come. And apparently all they do when they're not playing ball or whatever is shop. So the revenues that are generated by each party are much higher for girls sports than they are for boys. So girls sports aren't typically as, as sought after because sports recruiters think, oh, we want the big ones, you know. Not necessarily. You want the profitable ones. And that's where you have to learn to think about what kind of sports you're targeting, what kind of facilities you're making and who you can go after that you've got enough ammunition to be able to do it. So that's a sports thing. Military is basically, the great thing about military is that they talk to each other. Uh, Kristen Phelps is married to one of our fine Marines here, right? And she can tell you that on the Marine, or all the military bases, Facebook is how they communicate. They put any information on Facebook and that's how they inform everybody so y'all working that base Facebook and making sure they know and can send out to all their family and friends information on how affordable and wonderful it is to come here and stay, that's the trick. So there's, you can leverage the military you've got into more leisure if uh, you work it that way. Military reunions are a great market. I'm not going to go into that too much because Peter uh, is a master at that and uh, he can talk about that more. 
um, leisure. You've got retired baby boomers out there who were looking for bargain beach vacations. They would love a place like this. They can come here, they can get a much less rate than they get at the beach. They're not, in their opinion, I mean, driving 30 minutes to the beach is nothing, okay, for the price. So here they've got affordable housing or uh, overnights <clears throat> and affordable food and dining, and they can go to the beach when they want to because they don't want to go sit at the beach all day anyway. They just want to kind of be there and be able to kind of knock around. So retired baby boomers and the other group that's similar to them is the millennials, the young folks um, under the age of 23 because they're looking for bargains too. And right now you still fall in that bargain category. And then the retirement community we talked about. Meeting facilities, um, all of your meeting facilities here are at hotels. So what that means is the hotels that have those meeting facilities are really the ones that are primarily responsible for filling them up. You should be looking and targeting for meetings and groups, but it's not your priority um, to go after. And then business segment, again, is about 25% of what you have. That doesn't mean you ignore them because you can't exactly recruit them in. They just come because they're doing business here. But you can increase the per visitor spend of those people by having handy information in their hand that tells them where the good places to eat and where the good places to shop. Business travel, especially women, because this is the first time they're on the road without somebody screaming at them 24 hours a day wanting something, guess what they do at night? They shop. So you can really, you can really make a difference in your per visitor spend. And what, why do I keep hitting on shopping? Why do I keep talking about shopping? What's that got to do with tourism? Come in, yes, see, she's been to marketing college. I love Chris. <laughs> it's the sales tax, people. The only reason that you're in the tourism business, the only reason that you're here in this room together looking at this is because tourism brings money to town. And yes, it brings all the revenues, which benefit all of you that have businesses. But everybody that lives here, what they're getting out of it, sales tax, which we call tax relief. Because these people that don't live here come here and spend their money, you don't have to spend that money to have <coughs> the same amount of goods and services that you get. The more out of tax, tourism, the whole definition of tourism is getting money that doesn't live here to come be spent here for the benefit of the people that live in this community. So that's why you want to know the per visitor spend part of it. Um, facilities we talked about um, that you might look at and there are different ones that you can look. And then the other one is just monitoring the, the per diem rate. That means the government rate. Um, you can affect that. It's not easy to. Uh, Lynn can definitely talk about that. <laughs> She's been with that. She's danced around that one for a while. Uh, it has to how you raise that government rate, which could make a difference. So that's all I'm going to cover now. And uh, Marlise, again, who's our state research guru, um, um, will take it. Right well, away. I just need you to want me to do my part first, though? Yeah. <laughs> I think he's going to Hey, we're just going to show real fast here before Marlies talks about some of the things that the um, Tourism Development Authority and the community have been working on. And we first want to acknowledge the significant collaboration that we've had with the Chamber and the tourism efforts that they have, and you'll see their footprints and um, um, uh, efforts throughout this process. First, about our strategic initiative, and it is an evolving strategy that we have here because we're responding to what people are telling us and try to move in that direction there. So um, to quote one of our employees there, we're trying to be Semper Gumby around here about <laughs> some of this good. stuff. So previously, our strategy was to build things that people can visit and just the things that can draw those overnight stays simply by what they are as it is. And then activities that would encourage visiting and particularly that um, put our place in a, our community postured in a way that you're to be known for excellent activities and events that have a, a lot of professionalism associated with it. And the other was about in the promotion, obviously our destination and sports, um, which we've tried to promote greatly as it was. 
And our initial strategy was not to duplicate what the county was doing and that ours was to augment that and do things that we're doing on our end and that particularly to work with the state um, tourism and travel effort as it is there. Now that's evolving somewhat, particularly in the area where we were very event-centered before and now what we've become is events and experiences is what we've been working on lately as it is. And in doing so, um, we've reacted to um, advertising in such a way that includes all the area, not just within the corporate limits of the city of Jacksonville. And we've really gone to some advancement in trying to enhance the experiences that people have while they're here as it was, and to come up with ways to add additional experiences. And all that's been done within our mantra of receive a hero's welcome um, in the marketing um, efforts that we did with North Star and destination marketing. Now to do this, um, we obviously don't have any full-time staff, so we've engaged um, consultation, action, and um, advice and counsel as it was. And the panels that we have uh, associated here are ones that uh, allow us to put together um, the projects that we have and to receive expert advice and counsel. And we have new team members with us today that are going to give us similar type advice and counsel as it was there. Now, they identified significant assets, which none of which will be surprising to anyone in this room, is that the military and the military related, which you spoke of as before. And then it was the outdoor activities, fishing, hunting, things such as that, that might bring people to the community that don't show up in, you know, as much in the, the area there, but we're getting some ancillary information that that has some advantage to it. Oh, yeah, and sports, we believe greatly that we can see the needle move um, if from some of the hotel operators about when they have sports in their in their facilities there. And the other ones, other experiences, other things that we need to build up and make something happen with at the time. Now, we did look at, in the area of sports, a destination study. This is merely a feasibility study that the question was asked, what sport or sports, in combination or singularly, would produce the most overnight stays in an enduring and sustainable manner? And of course, it has come back with a recommendation, and we're still processing and working through that. In other sports activities, we've encouraged some that are more ancillary to what their core mission was, such as the Terracross event. I never knew they raced these little vehicles. <laughs> and of course, um, as, as Susan Baptist, our re Director of Recreation Services, will tell you, she had an extraordinarily muddy experience to offer them <laughs> on that time as it was, but they loved it. It was hogs and slop out there. So, and then the other one, right here on New Bridge Street, we did, and that's the, um, um, you know, the um, um, Hot Import Nights. Boy, the name just went out of my head. Anyway, and of course, many of us had never heard of it, but the Fast and Furious now is on movie number eight or nine or something, and that is what spurned the, that movies off to do things, and they're returning again next year. In our case, um, they had to turn cars away. They did not have enough room, and of course, it fits a demographic that um, um, they came out and they did this. It was horrible weather, but they were out there as it was, and we love showing Sergeant Major Joe Hool's um, little vehicle there with his t-shirt cannon um, attached as it was there. So yeah, big hit there. And then the other was about in the outreach um, strategy that we've had. Um, again, this is with the help of our consultants and such there. Susan Dozer, who's at home sick today, is not here with us. But we've, we've tried to improve our website in such a way that makes it more of our nerve center. Um, we've gone for some things that are making us, um, you know, m particularly proud of it. We're advertising the memorials. We're pushing those out in travel guides and things such as that. And obviously, through Visit NC, we've done a lot with digital influencers and some PR and media relations. We're working on some earned media now and doing some things such as that. And, of course, re event recruitment like some of those that you saw. And one of the ones that we're really proud of is how we're pushing out about the Marine Corps Half Marathon that will mm. celebrate one of its anniversaries this year as it is. And that experience that you can have of a Marine in Delta Blues putting a medal around your neck for what some people will have is things on their bucket list. Wow. You run it entirely yeah. aboard a military mm. installation. You're able to feel that special feeling of having done something in accomplishment there. And so that's the type of experience. We also, again, through Visit NC, we put together additional videos, and this one was targeted both at some retirees and visitation, and it goes on the themes, this is where heroes train. Um, and it's, um, it's up on the Visit NC site now and other places that we're doing. The newest thing to all of us was to kind of do a familiarization tour. And that was where we actually brought in some of these digital influencers, some of these people that have some impressive blogs and such there, and show them our community. 
novelties such as Saigon Sam's and all the military paraphernalia that's there that all of us pass by, but unique things like a cruise um, on, the, on the New River. Um, and obviously our newest addition, the distillery now with moonshine that is being produced here in Onslow oh, yeah. County legally. <laughs> so, um, yeah, <laughs> we have, and so obviously the other part has been placements of media. And um, one of the bloggers, um, she actually ran um, the race, the, um, the engineer's extreme um, race as it was. And so she was able to give that first person experience in a, in a genuine manner um, that was not tried or anything like that. And so she has some pretty influence uh, that's going out there. Now for all the people on the tour, we took them out and used again a, a, um, a current vendor that we have that's doing paddle in sea at the Riverwalk Marina and show them the new river in a way that they could experience it and how they could bring others here. We took them to hot import nights so they could see that at night. And the next thing we did was the visit in sea um, to bring in their blogger and such there that where they do the media, social media takeover. And um, that was one cold day, Sergeant Major out there, you know, when we were out there telling that story as it was about what was going on. But we got some really wonderful things. And then this is Michelle Perry. She is wonderful. Think of that. She gets 388,000 visitors to her digital Jeez. media, unique visitors every month. She is a force to be reckoned with, and so we brought her in and showed her around with her husband, and we have um, benefited from that greatly. The other type of market that we helped with identify with Visit NC was a market of which connects to parents of military or spouses. And Joe, my gosh, was one that she principally works with spouses. So she does a lot of things with deployed persons and things such as that. And you can see her statistics there are pretty impressive uh, in her reach and such there. But um, she liked the way that Jacksonville was kind of reinventing itself, as she called it. And she also worked on some projects about things that you can do in Jacksonville, and particularly these 11 must-do activities oh, if you're cool. coming to visit here. You know this type of clickbait really gets yeah. picked up and, and moves around. It's, um, I've seen it in my local Facebook feed a, a gazillion times, and we're still not out there. Other earned media has been that of our state magazine, um, telling the story of the Monfort Point Marines, you know, a group of people who was ignored for so many years that the Marine Corps didn't even teach about what the heritage was of the Monfort Point Marines. Now they're front and center. Our relationships with our state magazine through our friends um, liked us also. We noticed that in the digital blast, they did not have um, any links to um, find out more information. They added it the next day after we um, pointed that out to them and went. What's up ahead? Um, the city manager is leading an effort to build a visitor center at the Jacksonville, Common, uh, the Jacksonville Landing, and that'll give some um, real point of presence to people visiting our community. We're going to do some more um, familiarization tours. Um, we learned a lot bringing those first ones in, as it was there. And um, we want to make some appearances at Travel Expo, more digital media, and we have a couple of projects that we want to share with you. One of them was, of course, the livability rankings through um, um, Oh, I've forgotten the name of the company. They do the, um, um, anyway, we got, they do do chamber stuff so much. But um, we've, we, we bought a three-year contract with them. Through the chamber, we've contracted with them to help us um, operate military reunions and to advance that cause. And one of the things that we felt the true impact was when we had the final muster of the 4th Marine um, um, Regiment. These were the people who fought on Iwo Jima. They fought in that battle. And they were going out of... Um, this was going to be the last time they were going to gather, the youngest of which well. was 92 years old. And so um, obviously the base had a great deal to do with the wonderful optics that were done here, but the emotions of that, um, of that day um, will rest with us for many times. And out here on the very street beside you here, um, you know, last year in February, we had the 75th anniversary of the 2nd Marine Division, which is among that uh, large uh, connection in our community there. And it was to really push our theme of receive a hero's welcome, and indeed that's what occurred here. And it was a significant moment, and we knew that we moved the needle on some overnight visitation as a result of that also for people to come and see and be a part of that too. So what now is, is we want to show the pride and hospitality that we have in our community, and that's part of a mantra of what the city is with our caring community um, uh, motto that we have. And then of course ensure they receive this hero's welcome while they're here. So in the projects, we're working with um, sports um, on there. We have given additional funds to the Sports Commission to develop two to three new events each year 
and they're to develop over 100 room nights for each of these events. And this is a three-year commitment that we have going forward here for that, so they'll build it up. And the return on investment that we have found for them has been pretty good, um, you know, $123 um, on the, what we've invested and has come back as economic um, incentive that we've seen overall as it was. Also, the docent program in which we're going to use volunteers for tour guides, uh, doing things like that. They'll be the public face of hospitality in our community. And we have two tour developments going on side by side. One is not moving as fast. That's getting a tour aboard the base. Uh, but we're still punching at that bag as it goes there. And the other is a tour of the Lejeune Memorial Gardens. And we're certainly hoping by the summer we'll have that up and operating because we know there's a pent up demand for things such as that as it is too. So some events are still on our list and some things are really proud. I mentioned to you about the Marine Corps Half Marathon. There's actually a series of these races that are all aboard the base that we fund the outside marketing for because the Marine Corps Community Services does not spend money to market it out of the community. And when we started, they had 300 runners. Now it's 1,300. It's a 34% increase over FY15 just yet. And thus far, this fiscal year, we've already had 1,200 room nights that have come from, that, uh, from those races that have been associated with that as it was. We've added an enhancement of the experience to this in that we added the Hero Mile. And this mile of those who were lost their lives post 9-11 um, out there, and many people have done this, this was an extraordinarily emotional part for the runners and we got great feedback from that as it was. Um, there's more than 3,500 marriage licenses in this community issued and um, the chamber has done a great job um, of trying to do something to get business from that. So they have championed the Bridal Expo which wouldn't think is a visitation effort, oh, but yeah. when they somebody books sixty thousand dollars worth of business, um, you know, the first year out of that, um, you know, um, it, it gets some attention as it was. So that's a brief overview of some things that we've been doing. Just so you give a little bit of background, we put a sheet in your packet too, of, um, with a little bit more detail of uh, what's there. And I'm gonna turn it over to Marlies then. You can sit there. Oh, you can sit there. oh and I should <laughs> I should mention while they're switching the one. Marlise also used to run the Goldsboro Wayne County Tourism Office, so she not only knows from the state, but she knows you well. So. <laughs> yeah. Is the presentation on, loaded already? Yeah. Just click the next. Oh, it's already okay. Yeah. I'll put together. Thank you. So Judy already told you a little bit about um, my background. I've been um, with Visit North Carolina or D Division of Tourism for almost 12 years, and then um, was in Goldsboro prior to that. Um, so I manage all the research projects for Visit NC, but today I'm just going to talk about the lodging to kind of coincide with your um, work that Judy's done for you. So I'm just going to jump right in there. And from my perspective, I always like to start with demand because we're um, a marketing organization, so we don't sell rooms directly. Demand is really the best indicator for us as a marketing agency. Um, it's the best indicator on how we can affect um, visitation efforts. So we don't build hotels, which is again is supply. Or we don't set the rates, which is the ADR. But our marketing can influence demand. And so occupancy is so affected by supply. I'm, I'm going to talk about occupancy a little later, but I'd like to start with demand because that that's really the actual heads and beds. That's the actual mm -hmm. number of room nights that were sold, which in turn can help you determine how many people are in your community. So the North Carolina lodging sector had a really good year in 2016. Demand growth was strong statewide, regionally, and here in Jacksonville. And I want to backtrack just a little bit and say thank you to Judy for providing me the Jacksonville star numbers. Um, we contract with Smith Travel Research to get North Carolina and that economic development region data, which is the yellow line and the red line. And then we also get US level data, which is the green line, but I didn't have just the city of Jacksonville. So I could tell you what was going on in southeastern North Carolina, but I was able to um, get some data from Judy to help me compare the city of Jacksonville to the region, the state, and the U.S. So that's kind of where that came from. But statewide, uh, room demand, so room nights sold last year was up 5%, and it hit record levels for the state. So again, that yellow line you can see was up 5% from 2015. Jacksonville actually sold more than 9% more room nights than 2015. So, you know, we heard earlier, oh, well, the, the numbers might not be good, oh, the numbers. Well, I'm here to say, I, I don't think things are going that badly here. I think your supply has a lot to do with your, with your numbers. So we're going to talk about that, but I don't think things are as bad as possible. I think you have a lot of opportunity. 
I think you have some challenges because you've got more rooms to fill. But I don't think the story is a bad story um, going on. Again, you've got a lot of newer properties, which is mm -hmm. a selling point. So your 9% growth in demand in 2016 is a terrific statistic. The southeast region, presumably affected by your strong demand growth, was up almost 7%, so 6.7%, the red line, in 2016. Um, also, when I looked at uh, room demand, so number of room nights sold in Jacksonville as a proportion of that southeast percentage, so your room night sold was about 14% of that southeast region. Uh, room demand was only up 1.7% nationally. So you can see North Carolina is really, in terms of growth, now this is not, direct, this is not room nights, but this is the growth. Um, North Carolina is outperforming the U.S., as a percentage of growth. As a percentage know. of growth. Yeah. So what this chart also shows is some volatility here in Jacksonville that wasn't seen in the state and the region over the past five years. And I only went back five years because about five years ago, the Department of Commerce changed those economic development regions um, from seven to eight. And so there wasn't no more eastern. Re so anyway, I don't have comparable data um, prior to 2012 for regions, I have statewide and I have the old regions. So that's, that's kind of why I went back to 2012 and in your report from Judy, I believe it goes to 2011. So I've got a five year, um, just so I can make things comparable. So that volatility there, per perhaps there were some deployment factors um, that increased demand in 13 and then and dipped in 15 and then way back up in 16. I'm not, I'm not sure why your demand numbers, again, these are room night sold, so this is not, Anything affected by your growth in supply, these are actually how many room nights were sold over the last year. They increased you know, a great deal. So nonetheless, it was a strong year, um, 2016. Now this slide, I know this is crazy busy, but I just wanted to show you how you compare to the other regions of North Carolina. So again, we now have eight regions, and it looks like my, um, my legend cut off a little bit, so you're only seeing six there, but anyway, there's eight. I'm not gonna point out the specific ones, but. So in 2012 and 13, uh, a couple of the regions had some negative growth in demand, but for the most part, demand posted record growth statewide. And while Jacksonville um, really was alone in that demand loss in 2015, you posted a larger increase in demand in 2016 than any other region in the state. So something good, really good happened here last year, despite your increasing number of room nights. So you had um, very high demand last year, demand growth. TDA. <laughs> <laughs> These are great numbers. Um, okay, so, all right, I know this, this is a little much, but I wanted to show you both demand, raw demand, and also demand growth. So if you look at the bars, that is that raw demand. Because of the, um, the different scales, it's, it's difficult to put these all on one slide. So what you have at the top is, um, your Jacksonville numbers, I'm sorry, you, I can't even see, yeah, Jacksonville is the blue, the southeast region is the red, and the North Carolina is the yellow. So you can see demand has been increasing, those bars, um, each year. You've had a little up and down here, but still, you know, a pretty good picture there. Um, there were more room nights sold on record for all three, the city, uh, the state, and the region, than on record. So uh, still good. That's a good year. Good year. All right, now let's move to occupancy because I, I know that that's important to hoteliers. I mean, it's important to all of us, but um, I know at the local level, occupancy can be a major concern um, with new properties being built and supply increasing. And we'll look at the supply in just a minute. You know, occupancy can suffer. When I was in Goldsboro, I, I remember uh, my first year there, we had three new hotels open. And it was great from a destination perspective because we had new properties to sell. We had, um, you know, fresh brand new hotels, but a couple of the hoteliers were really mad. You know, they, they, their occupancy individually was dropping and they could not believe when I reported their occupancy tax figures had increased. They were adamant that no, they had not increased because that one property was doing mm. worse. Well, there were more rooms and I, you know, I tried to explain, you know, we have more rooms to fill and more rooms are being filled, but they're not all at your property. But overall at the community level, you know, we saw more rain. So, you know, occupancy is, is definitely affected by supply. And while demand is still up here, um, you're collect and you're collecting more occupancy taxes because of that demand, um, individual businesses can be adversely affected at some point if your supply grows too much. So at the state level, occupancy, which again, the state is the yellow, so occupancy has increased at a, at a good steady pace over the last several years. 
the southeast region in the red has also seen fairly steady growth rate. Um, the U.S. had a little dip there. Um, let's see, that's the green. Had a, had a little dip there in 2013, but it's kind of steadied out. However, here in Jacksonville, you saw pretty significant decreases in occupancy in 2013 and then again in 15. <laughs> These dips are going to coincide with that increase in supply, which we're going to talk about in um, a few other slides. But over the last five years, your occupancy has decreased 9%. And, and while this slide, it may be a little troublesome, let's look at that supply indicator. So, okay. okay, so this slide, I know it's, it's way too much data for one graph, but this is a look at occupancy over the last five years, which are the bars, and room supply, which are the lines. So you can see when occupancy is higher, that supply didn't grow that much that year. But when supply kind of levels out, your occupancy goes up. So this is just, this just really is talking about the relationship between occupancy and supply. So my concern is that you not get too worried about your occupancy going down unless those individual businesses start really hurting. You know, overall, as a community, you're, as long as your tax collections are up and your demand is up, you know you have more people. So you're doing something right in terms of bringing Rude. people in to fill those rooms. You just got to keep it up, and you got to bring even more people in. So that, you know, that demand is showing that you've, you've got more people coming. You just got to put even more because of that supply. Are those occupancy numbers skewed by the new inventory? Yes, that's yes. what I'm saying. Occupancy mm -hmm. is skewed by inventory because it's a percentage of right, rooms filled. That's right. exactly right. At one time, which should exactly right. So my point is, your occupancy could drop, and you can still have more people and more money coming into the community because you have more rooms to fill. So what I'm saying is, it's not really a bad story. It's a, it's a challenge, but there's opportunity. You have new rooms, which visitors want would rather have a new nice hotel room. You have new room, b rooms, but you also have more of them to fill. So you have a harder job, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. So um, this is how your occupancy, again, the bars um, are the occupancy. Look at your supply growth over the last five years, 21% more room nights to sell in the last five years. That's a where lot. Where at the uh, state level, 3% mm -hmm. more. And we that is really high. And Lynn will probably confirm that, that 3% supply growth at the state level is really heavy growth very heavy growth yeah and we've seen that for a long time here in north carolina and the state and the southeast is seven percent over the last five years we've got 21 percent i mean this is a hard job you were you were very robust yes. in building yes. uh yes, new, new you hotels. might want to you might want to slow it down yeah <laughs> um so, <laughs> okay so this next slide is just that again just that supply growth comparing you look at look at this slide you can see how you really had a lot more rooms on the books in 2013 and you still increased in 14, 15, and 16. Even at your lowest growth, now this is just the growth percentage, even at your lowest growth um, in 2014, you were still higher than the state in the U.S. in terms of room growth. So you really had some heavy building going on in the last few years. Again, it could be good, it could be bad. I, I look at it as an opportunity really. And then I want to just um, go here again. This is just you compared to the other or to the eight economic development, or they're called prosperity zones, those regions of the state. Again, um, you overgrew. It shows how your supply growth <laughs> stacks up against those other regions. And you had higher <laughs> supply growth than any region of the state in the last five years. Now, we'll say the Asheville region, the Western region, is is increasing a lot of room, you know, it's adding a lot of rooms. Build, baby, build. Yeah, they are, yeah. that is another region, but they haven't seen even this much growth. This is um, incredible growth. Um, switching gears just a little bit, so your demand by month, and I think Judy talked about this a little bit, but I wanted to see how your demand by month compared to the other regions of the state, um, or first of all, I don't, maybe I didn't do a region by state, so I just did the um, demand uh, for North Carolina in yellow by month um, versus the southeast region, uh, that multi-county region that we're in, um, versus Jacksonville, and so you're really uh, not atypical, you're, you're pretty, um, pretty like the rest of the state. Again, you're selling more room nights in the summer, as is the southeast. Well, you've got the beach, you're on the coast. So that said, it's really not surprising. Mm -hmm. Well, the state as a whole um, sold more room nights really in the fall than the other region. So yeah, this is not that atypical. So I, I present this to show that um, you really have some of the same challenges with that seasonality as the whole rest of the state does. So I, I didn't see any differences there. 
And then finally, in summary, just my perspective of, of this data and what uh, Judy presented to you is that the demand in Jacksonville seems to be affected by a little bit different factors. While you have the same kind of seasonality, there seem to be some different factors going on in terms of um, up and down in demand by year than we're seeing and more volatility than we're seeing in other parts of the state. So I don't know if that is a deployment. Mm -hmm. It could be a weather issue, you know, if there were, you know, yep. a storm, you know, it could be the storm last year. I, I don't know what that is, but it seems to be there's more of this going on up and down than kind of this in terms of demand growth. Um, again, large increases in supply over the last five years uh, are going to need to be addressed in terms of marketing. Again, you've, you've got an opportunity, but you've got a lot more rooms to fill to, make, to satisfy your hoteliers and, and the owners. And then I suspect that you have a slightly different market than the rest of the state in general, but uh, again, your monthly stay patterns are not that different from the state. So I would recommend, I, I'm thrilled to hear that you're working with Visit NC, and I would recommend you continue to work with our PR department, our marketing department, and really all of us at Visit NC to help um, get the most bang for your marketing dollar buck. Um, buck. I think that's all my slides there. Yeah. So, um, of course, I'll be around for questions, and I think we're just going to pass just it on down now, now, and then um, I'll be around for questions if you have any. So I'm Lynn Minges, and I uh, represent the interest of restaurants and hotels across the state and uh, commend you all for coming together to take a hard look at, you know, what's going on here in Jacksonville and Onslow County. I've been down several times, had lots of conversations with Glenn, who you can see is working really hard along with the TDA to drive the <coughs> man, and they're, they're doing a great job of, of that. I don't think you can ask for a whole lot more. Um, you know, and drive and demand, but the reality is, as they've said to you, you've got 24 hotel properties, you're running about 50% occupancy. To be able to sustain those hotels, keep them here and in business, we, you, have to really work hard to continue to drive demand. And so, you know, I think it's uh, positive that you're coming together to look at this. You've hired Judy, who is uh, one of the best and brightest anywhere in the country. Oh, thank you. Um, I paid you know, her. To, to try to help mm -hmm. you take a hard look at what, what are those market potentials? What are those opportunities to continue to drive even more demand and fill up those hotel rooms? Um, I, as Marley said, used to run the State Office of Tourism, and it's interesting that across North Carolina, there are 55 million hotel room nights for sale in the state every year. 55 million hotel rooms for sale. Here in this community, you all have about 900,000 hotel room nights to sell, just shy of that, about 859,000. So, you know, it, it, when you start looking at what that opportunity is, if you were selling every single hotel room 365 days a year, it would be almost 900,000 room nights. Um, so that's going to take a whole lot of work from a whole lot of folks mm -hmm. to continue to drive demand to fill up those hotel rooms. Obviously, you're not going to be running at 100%, but we hope to run somewhere above 50. Otherwise, you're not going to have 50, uh, 24 hotel room, hotels. You're going to have something mm -hmm. less than that. Um, so plenty of opportunity, and I will just defer to Peter and Chris, who have some other pearls of wisdom, and then look forward to engaging with you in discussion about next steps. All right. Great. Great. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I want to tell you a story about perspective from this, from the Columbus aspect. Um, I want to give you a background first of what's happening in our destination is that Columbus was, uh, went into the recession late. Uh, and that, of course, that means that we're still recovering from it. Our housing market, for example, is still not as robust as it was prior to the recession. Um, we also took note, the CVB there took note of sequestration and I guess we'll be competing with the um, weed blower. Yeah, the blower. Yeah. Uh, the CVB took note of uh, sequestration that was happening at Fort Benning, um, plus uh, the DOD put an 860-room hotel on the installation and then privatized it. IHG is now running that hotel. Does that sound familiar to y'all? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the military business in Columbus, uh, this in comparison to what's happening in Jacksonville, represents about 24% of the market. And these are friends and family that are visiting uh, as well as contractors. So we had the recession that's still hurting us. We had seek restoration and we had the mega hotel out, out of Fort Benning. So what we did to face that is that we had to figure out how to replace Lost Market. And that's the thing we focused on was the, um, that 23%, uh, 24% uh, uh, military families coming in for graduations and other purposes at Benning. So we worked with our advertising agency and a research firm 
Initially, uh, Judy did the last uh, comprehensive analysis of Columbus, you know, it's like that. <laughs> and then we uh, engaged uh, Gray Research Solutions uh, to work together to, we wanted them to look at uh, finding new audience for us. About four years ago, Columbus introduced the Whitewater and Zipline um, adventure in the destination. We had the longest urban whitewater course in the world in Columbus. So we just knew that that was going to flood the market, no pun intended, with, <laughs> with new, new customers. <clears throat> that didn't happen. We had great numbers, great trips on the, on the whitewater course, but our overnights did not happen the way we thought they would. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we could not recruit. Um, we thought for sure that there'd be new product release in the market, you know, these kayakers and paddle people that build paddles for kayaks and so forth. We just knew that these trade shows would flock to Columbus because typically these shows are in the wilderness. You have to travel an hour or so into the woods, eat lunch out of a sack, they had to put tents up and so forth just to test and introduce their new product. That didn't happen to, for us. So we charged the advertising agency and Gray Research Solutions to find new market for us. Um, so what they did is they came in and they looked at the assets of the destination, those things that were, would be appealing. Then we also looked at emerging trends, travel trends. We did not want to uh, catch something that was already in place. We wanted to look at something that was uh, uh, coming onto the marketplace so that we could be on the front end of that marketing uh, aspect of that. So what uh, Gray Research came back and told us was that uh, after they did a, a, almost an eight-month study for us, 72% uh, of leisure visitors said they would likely stay and visit in Columbus, but 53%, which was the largest uh, component, are multi-generational families are hot for Columbus. So that means what that means is these are boomers that are traveling with their kids, they're traveling with the grandkids because millennials don't have any money. They got some of them have kids. <clears throat> the boomers are paying, their parents are paying for those trips. And so they're all traveling together. So we've begun the process of integrating this strategy into our uh, strategic plan and our marketing campaign. We roll that out in FY19, which begins in July. So we, <clears throat> what we did is we, uh, during this entire process, we told our hoteliers, told our attractions, because again, they were crying because of the of, of what was happening in the marketplace, occupancy was off, is that we told them that we had identified what the problems were, the challenges were. We continued to communicate with them during the, in the entire process of this research, and then we did a big reveal when the research was completed. So um, we had a, a big focus group very similar to this where we hosted a lunch and invited everyone to, to come in and Gray Research presented their data Stamp, which is our advertising agency, presented the information of how they were going to begin to uh, reveal or integrate the, um, the strategy uh, in our marketing campaigns, and it was a big hit. And of course, this was all posted online. Um, so, the, the, our takeaway was is that if uh, sequestration ends, or if Columbus Fort Benning benefits from another <coughs> BRAC or base realignment closure, then increase in military will just be icing on the cake. You know, we're, it's not that we're ignoring military at all. Uh, it's a very important uh, engine for economic driver for our community. But we have decided that we've got to find new leisure market to replace that 24% that will never come back in, our, in, in uh, the short term. With the privatization of the military hotel, what we did is we, we, we sent letters, we went to the Pentagon, we met with the DOD, we talked to everyone that we could, and they were very courteous. And we appreciate that. <laughs> but they did what they did. And, the, and again, it, it, we've always stated up, up front that this, this um, pushback against the hotel is not anti-military at all. Our concern is that the hotel is, a, is a, available for unofficial use. So whether or not you have a military ID or not, if you can get on the installation, you can spend the night in the hotel. You can actually go online right now and do a search for for, uh, hotels near Fort Benning and find that hotel and book a room, whether you have a military ID or not. So that is creating this, this uh, uh, pressure on our local, uh, on the private sector hotels uh, and their performance. So we did a number of strategies, obviously. We built a unique website. We've done search engine optimization. We've got a regular online campaign that deals with that so that we, when someone does a search for Columbus and Fort Benning stays, they find those private sector hotels first because it's an installation. There's nothing there. I mean, if you don't have an ID, you can't do anything. 
um, but we push out our private sector hotels because they're like really great restaurants and entertainment and retail and so forth and so on. So that's our strategy to work against that. And if you do a search for Visit Fort Benning, we usually um, uh, come up in the top five uh, research results. Military unions, big business for Columbus. I know this is part of a strategy that's sort of being talked about here, which is awesome. Um, in Columbus, it's not just armies. Fort Benning is an army uh, training facility. It's uh, one of the largest uh, installations for training in the world. What we're finding is we're getting a lot of uh, Navy reunions because these guys are looking for a place to go to have a good time, to tell their stories and um, relive and have uh, memories together as a group. So what we have done is we participate in a number of military union travel shows, YMRC, which is uh, union uh, your reunion military connection I guess it's military they have to have an acronym and then re um, <laughs> reunion friendly network which is RFN uh, these meetings are all about relationships so that's why it's important um, for us to attend these shows because it's all about establishing a relationship with those uh, meeting planners and all of those groups have someone assigned to their unit that plans that meeting um, these meetings also uh, rotate so they're not uh, uh, specific to a destination or if they don't come to Columbus just because of Fort Benning or because of the Infantry Museum or Port Columbus which is a Naval Museum they're coming because of the service that my staff offers offers them we will take them from ground zero whether they have any planning experience or not to the end and if and if they are season experience we just roll out the red carpet for them and to give you an example this is a commitment for us and if, mm -hmm. if you all dig into this uh, in a big way it is a commitment to make it work and to give you an example of how that how that does work for us or has worked for us in the customer service that my staff provides we had a client <clears throat> or a, a reunion guy excuse me with the group and he actually he took a tumble he stepped off the motor coach and fell face first literally into the sidewalk and broke his nose and he was in pretty bad shape and he was an elder, elderly gentleman well, my staff took him to the hospital and sat with him until it was time for him to go home. I mean, that's the kind of commitment that, that you have to have with these military units. And they talk about it. This group continues to talk about the level of service that my staff gave them were in Columbus. So this word of mouth or this testimonial stuff that happens at this, these trade shows is invaluable. Um, let's see. <clears throat> sports. Sports is big business in Columbus. It is about, it's 6.2% of our uh, business is sports related. <coughs> the thing that um, Columbus is dealing with now is the investment in the infrastructure. Um, we got into the sports business because Columbus was the um, uh, destination for fast pitch, women's fast pitch softball during the Olympics. Um, fabulous experience, uh, but the thing that um, has happened is that the city has not been able to reinvest in the infrastructure, the stadiums, the ball fields, soccer fields, tennis courts, so forth. The private sector has had to come forward and deal with that. But even they are beginning to fall behind because they have uh, basically um, overbuilt that, uh, those complexes. Our sports council is dealing with that. Um, they're sort of beginning to put their toe in the water and offer that assistance. But that's a dangerous or a slippery slope because uh, if the city feels like the, our sports council has excess money to prop up those facilities, then that could become a drain on the sports council's funding. The other thing that we dealt with uh, on and off in our uh, experience with our sports council is that it can be a competition for funds. Uh, in the beginnings, our sports council was privately funded. It was, uh, it was intended to operate as a nonprofit. Um, they did a good job of not operating at a profit. Um, but during the Olympics, they had a $3 million endowment left over uh, uh, from funds that had been collected to produce the games. Well, they've spent that money. They have gone through that money. So it became a competition for hotel motel tax. In, Col in Georgia, CVBs or destination marketing organizations are funded through hotel motel tax. Columbus, my organization, gets uh, half of that. So we're at um, 4%, but a quarter of that money is restricted for sports marketing. But you can see the number, a quarter of a million dollars, I mean, excuse me, um, uh, almost uh, half a million dollars is responsible for less than 7% of the market. So there's, a, there's an imbalance as far as that return on investment that, that Judy mentioned. So um, my 
closing remark about sports is that it is big. Um, it's mostly weekend for us, except if you have something that starts in the middle of the week, and these are these tournaments, so um, like soccer and tennis and so forth. But the, the caution is, is that it can be a competition on your tourism authority for, for funding or for other, if you're in competition for membership and that sort of thing. And then also the fact that it's got to be a commitment to, to invest in the infrastructure because everyone is building something new. And one of the things that we failed to uh, op, um, leverage is back during one of Judy's presentations, she advised Columbus to specialize in a particular niche for sports, and we didn't do that. We wanted to be all things for everyone. And we've done a good job with it. But because we haven't specialized, every, almost every destination in uh, Georgia is building these mega complexes now. So we're having to compete with a deteriorating infrastructure in order to maintain the business that we have. The good news is, is that, our, again, our level of customer service is superior to the competition today. But eventually, they're going to look at these new facilities. They're going to look at new hotels. They're going to look at convenience. And the other organizations will raise their level of service to, to be very, very competitive with us. And then you get into this bidding war, which, which frankly, no one wins. That's all I've got. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Cavanaugh. Uh, my name of my firm is Magellan Strategy Group, uh, and uh, I work as a consultant, uh, a little bit of a jack of all trades in a number of different areas, but particularly with attractions and destinations. Uh, as Judy mentioned earlier, uh, I used to work at Biltmore State in Asheville, um, and uh, I suspect that one of the reasons people hire me as a consultant uh, now is that somehow they think I'm going to bring a branch of the Billboard State uh, to their communities. Uh, that's not going to happen. Um, but I spend a lot of time working in tourism product development, which I'll touch on uh, here shortly. Um, there's five things I want to build upon. Actually, it's kind of a good wrap up uh, to what's been said already and to build off of everyone's good insight. Um, the first thing is, is that I think very clearly uh, there's an opportunity for Jacksonville, uh, just like Columbus uh, went through, to diversify your customer base. And one of the things that struck me was that uh, in, uh, on page 13 of Judy's uh, excellent report is that leisure only represented about 21% of the total uh, product mix. Right. We're at... We're, we're in a fantastic time for travel and tourism right now in this nation because we have the two largest segments of the population traveling right now who have ever traveled the earth, and that's baby boomers, many of whom are either getting ready to retire or have retired and do have money, and millennials. Uh, and in many respects right now, millennials, uh, those people born roughly between 1980 and 2000, are actually beginning to out-travel uh, those folks uh, in, in the uh, baby boomer population. Maybe not outspending, but they're certainly out-traveling. Um, boomers are critical because uh, many of them will travel to look, seek out retirement locations. And Judy's already touched on the importance of positioning Jacksonville as a retirement destination. Uh, well, the, as, as to paraphrase a, a term that's been used for economic development, uh, tourism is the first date, uh, first date of retirement, uh, because a retiree, a prospective retiree, will come here once, twice, probably several times to check out the destination as a potential retirement location. Um, and then you have millennials, uh, and that's obviously the future and where the market is headed. But right now, we're at the convergence of both of these great audiences, very sizable audiences, traveling. And the great thing is, is that. Both of these audiences are not buying stuff. Boomers have all the stuff that they need and they don't need any more stuff. And millennials would rather spend money on experiences. And so they would much rather travel with friends, with significant others, uh, with loved ones to, um, to engage in experiences uh, and a great meal or visit a, a distillery or a brewery than they would to spend mo more money on stuff. Second point is, is that uh, if you look at that chart on page 13, one thing that really jumped out at me is how many of your guests are likely paying a deeply discounted rate for their hotel rooms, yes. whether it be military uh, or corporate or groups, um, and trying to identify a way of driving a higher price point for hotel rooms is really, I think, essential, an essential strategy. Uh, and leisure is going to be, of all these segments, the most likely uh, to pay 
closer to a full uh, rate, uh, to a, a less discounted rate than many of these other segments. Um, third, product development. Um, and product development can in, insist of both hard product development, which is capital product investment, or soft product development, uh, events, uh, races, uh, festivals. Um, I spend a lot of time in a lot of different communities, and there's a huge focus right now on product development. You heard uh, Peter's tale of what they've done in Jacksonville uh, with the, lar the longest uh, urban whitewater course in the world. Who would have ever expected something like that in a place like Columbus, Georgia? Um, there's a lot of focus right now, so much so that destination marketing organizations are really rapidly becoming destination management organizations to not only promote the destination, but to identify product development opportunities and to move the destination <coughs> to an audience to where you want to be, whether it's in sports, leisure product development, outdoor recreation, which you heard Glenn talk about earlier. The product development is a significant part of what um, the Tourism Development Authorities and other similar types of organizations are charged with. Uh, the, my fourth point, uh, to build off of what uh, Peter talked about, what Judy talked about in her report, is to look, at, as, as a friend of mine says, look for those places between the elephant's toes when it comes to sports and other opportunities like that. Sports is an arms race right now. It is absolutely an arms race. I encourage you to go visit places like Sevierville and Pigeon Ford oh, yeah. to see what they're doing and really? trying to attract youth, youth and amateur sports right now. They have amazing facilities. And of course, they also have a, a, a hotel product mix, which is, tends to be more geared toward mid-price and, and more uh, lower scale rooms. So they decided to get into the sports in a big way, and they're no different from a number of other communities. But between the investment required for facilities, the investment required for incentives, giving rooms away, look for the places between the elephant's toes where you won't get crushed by the pigeon forges of the world. Um, I, I always love telling this story, a community I know that uh, Judy is very familiar with, Cabarrus County right outside of Charlotte, Concord. Um, they recently uh, attracted a horseshoe competition, um, and that's an opportunity to, and, and it was very successful, and that's, a, that's an opportunity that doesn't require extensive amount of, of physical product development, but there's all these niches of people who are fanatical about things like horseshoes, and you know, there are adult sports tournaments, for instance. Um, you know, there's all these other niches out there. Look to see where you can be an expert and really succeed, and compete and succeed. The last thing I'll say is just to emphasize the importance of lodging revenue. Uh, Judy talked about tax revenue, and I'll, I'll go one step further to talk, em emphasize the importance of lodging revenue because that funds occupancy tax. And I do a lot of research and work in occupancy tax policy. And occupancy tax is the engine for destination marketing. Um, as, as I'm fond of, of quoting uh, a line from the movie The Right Stuff, uh, no bucks, no buck rogers. Uh, and <laughs> without occupancy tax, that's what funds the promotion uh, of your community. That's what also goes to help pay for a number of product development initiatives. And you talked about, Glenn talked earlier about some of the things that they're doing. Uh, on product. So driving that occupancy tax revenue is essential and that can only be done by getting a higher uh, average daily rate uh, on rooms. Uh, so those are really the five things I wanted to emphasize just to build upon uh, what has been said by uh, each one of our panelists up here. Um, you're in a great position to succeed, um, but the future is now in terms of where you begin to position yourself uh, to succeed for the future. Awesome, thank Great. you. So just kind of in, in quick summary wrap up, uh, in addition to the data that's in the report, Marley said, you're doing pretty good. Uh, you may not see that, but you're actually growing pretty well. You just overbuilt. Uh, Lynn's point is do this more often. <laughs> you know, look at where you are, look at where others are so that you have well-balanced growth and don't get into problems that a lot of other areas has. Peter said, 
know which niches you can grow and which ones you didn't don't need to get into a dog fight over and not just because don't just jump on one wagon because that sounds good and your the backside of targeting a new niche. I mean there's some definite niches that you can go after, but the backside of that is you've got to have staff to go after them and you have to have service staff to take care of them. So it's not just a uh, we're going to target a little bit of this. You have to actually grow the DMO, the destination marketing organization, if you're really going to do that. And what Chris is saying is is brilliant because we can't emphasize enough that you're not the only ones that are looking at sports. There are a lot of people that have gone after sports and they all go after the same kinds of things. So you know, look at what you can strategically go after. What Identify the underserved sports niches and master those rather than just going after soccer and same thing that the bigger guys who have bigger budgets than you can do to you. And then Glenn's point is you know, you're doing a lot of things right now. Um, what you want to do is just make sure that you are keeping this in balance and that uh, you, you're pretty clear about what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what you're going after. I'll wrap up with the last point on rate. Um, I didn't use the term, my husband, what, this is my husband, Dr. Bill Randall, by the way, who is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's retired, and so now, you know, I have a PhD, does my number crunches, so I, <laughs> it's great, but uh, he wouldn't let me use the word in the report that the hoteliers here are cannibalizing themselves, but I was really tempted to use it, uh, and what that means is you're lowering rate lower than you should be. Now, you will not hear the terms price fixing come out of my mouth, but there's a point where you're pricing below what anybody around you is pricing that's pretty ridiculous. <coughs> so one of the things I would encourage you to do as a hotel uh, is to not look just within the Jacksonville market, but to look outside of it, particularly New Bern and Wilmington, and look at where you're pricing and don't go down too low. It's harder to go back up in rate than it is to go down. And you're, go, you're, you're fighting a battle to the bottom line. Um, so watch that because there's really no need for that to be going on. Um, you've got more than rate. What you need to do is target these market segments and be working at how you're going to bring them in. You and, and then bottom, bottom line is you need to shift your thinking from being military dependent to building these other segments so that when the military goes up and down, that becomes your boom years, but your rent gets paid with the bottom line that you're targeting all these different segments. Make sense? So that's where you want to take this, and, and this was a good first step to do, and you've got great resources that you can bring in, and again, I'm, I'm very impressed with what y'all have done so far, uh, just addressing this, but build it strategically and make sure you're taking everybody along with you. And Glenn, now we can open it up to uh, uh, conversation and questions that each of you may have. I have a question. It's, 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 I guess it's strategic in nature. Peter, if you're kind of talking about what you had talked about uh, with the competition of funds, competing for funds, mm -hmm. uh, big picture-wise, would it be something for this community, I'm not saying the city of Jacksonville, I'm saying the city of Jacksonville and, and Onslow County, to consider um, looking at creating a CVB that might consider bringing all entities to work underneath it, the tourism and sport. I mean, I'm the chairman of the sports commission, but it, I mean that doesn't matter. <laughs> what I'm saying is, if it's in the best interest for this for the city and the county, would it uh, behoove us to consider bringing things under one umbrella, so we're not competing with funds? We all we we go together, holding hands, and ask for all the money then. Uh, you know, from that perspective, and that's not directed towards. I mean, that's that's directed to any, to to any any of the panelists, but you you kind of address right. that. 
Well, we are fortunate that uh, Columbus is a consolidated government, so we only have one. You got it easy. <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely, I mean, if there is one organization that manages that process, and we have danced with our sports commission over the years trying to, to merge, uh, and we get very close sometimes, and then it just doesn't happen for, for whatever reason. A community, uh, of a, not in Rudy, but to anyone, a, a community of our size. Mm -hmm. uh, smart move. Pros and cons. Just throwing it out there to ask. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> since we have the elected officials in the room, okay, so I, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> you know where I stand on that. Anyone? <laughs> I'll, I'll, just, I'll just take a stab at that. I have... Uh, seeing communities splinter their efforts uh, significantly by having too many people trying to do uh, similar or the exact same things. Yeah. And I think it, to your point, it can work in a larger destination uh, where there are more stakeholders, but even larger destinations have seen great success in bringing uh, all those uh, entities under one roof. Mm -hmm. Just to make have them work closer together, even if they're, you know, they may be separate 501c6 organizations, um, Tampa Bay, I think, does a great job, for instance, yeah. of attracting events, uh, you know, world-class events. Um, and they have a sports commission which is housed underneath their uh, CVB. It's a separate 501c6 organization, but they work like that. Um, and I'm all, personally, uh, I, I would be all for trying to bring as many of those uh, entities under uh, one umbrella uh, to, to make it work harder. And also to make it easier, quite frankly, for someone who's, say, a sports, a, 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 a sports organizer. You know, you mentioned when, when someone wants to come to this area, where, what's, what's their first stop? Uh, do they go to the chamber? Do they go to the city? Do they go to the sports commission? Do they go to uh, Onslow County? You know, and so uh, how do you make it easier for those folks to do business? Mm -hmm. I, I will say I work with a lot of destinations across the country and there's a there's a continual discussion out there about should we be a chamber or should we be a CVB kind of thing. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that the money or the strategic vision is united. Uh, Tulsa is one I'm thinking about. Everybody in Oklahoma is part of the chamber and the chamber was able, we went in and did a complete study much like this and found out that they were under funded compared to their primary competitors a lot. Well, fortunately, Tulsa people there have oil and money, so there's some deep pockets. And the chamber head was powerful enough, he went out and raised $3 million in three months and gave it to the CVB or to the tourism effort. So it doesn't matter who is driving the wagon as long as there are enough horses pulling it. Mm. And so that's really, if they're all on the same page, it can be a chamber, it can be a CVB or not. Really doesn't matter. It's the strategic vision of the community and that not being fractured with different visions. So I take it back to leadership of the community mm -hmm. as opposed to whether it's a chamber or whether it's a CVB. It's leadership within that community, the business leaders, if you would, are the ones that are like, okay, how can we get this funding together and how's the whole pie going to be divvied up and not letting it get off on one tangent or another and get out of balance. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Just out of curiosity, uh, Judy, do, do you all capture anything with bed and breakfast in the state? Yes. Um, Remember, bed and breakfast is usually only a few rooms, so you might have 20 B&Bs, but they're not equal to one-third of one hotel. So we do, uh, typically that's leisure. They don't keep records the way other hotels do. They don't report star or anything like that, but I work with a whole lot of them. So I've learned their patterns over the years and they're wonderful to have, especially if you have some of the larger, more well-known ones and you do have that up and down the coast here. Uh, anything particular about that you no, want? I just was curious uh, when you talked about room availability of those kind right. of that was included sometimes. They can be good. That's been a product life cycle thing as, as bed and breakfast. You know, everything has in tourism has about a 20-year product life cycle. You're new and then you're sort of through unless you reinvent. And right now their market was primarily baby boomers and whatnot who are now too old to climb the steps 
carrying <laughs> luggage and don't want to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom because people will hear them in the next room. You know, so there's, there are a lot of issues with B&Bs right now um, across the, the industry with that, but it's, it's a good product category. It's really good for North Carolina, particularly the coast and the mountains, and um, so, yeah, it's still there. Any other questions? Building on that question, how has the Airbnb? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, we could spend a lot of time talking about that. The, the whole uh, off, off uh, booking engines is similar to what's called OTAs, um, uh, like Kayak or Expedia or any of those online travel agencies. It is all about tracking the money. Uh, so, keeping it's, it's there's a lot of work that's still being done every day and, and uh, the industry in a couple of places sued some of the OTAs uh, because what happens is like Expedia charges you $100 for the room, but they only pay the hotel $70, but they charge you the tax on 100 but they only pay the tax on the 70 So they're skimming off the top on the taxes, but right now the law's on their side. Uh, they fought it out a couple of times, and so far they're ahead of it, but that's still being resolved. But Airbnb is having a, those kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, sharing economy groups are having a major impact. Right now, there are estimates that it's as high as 7% of the whole industry. It's a $30 billion company, yeah. Airbnb, by itself, growing bigger than Hilton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they paint themselves as being mom and pops, but really it's a corporation that's right. driving demand. In a lot of cities, I haven't looked at Jacksonville or Onslow County in particular, but in a lot of cities, there's a tremendous amount of inventory. Many. So if you looked at that, mm -hmm. in some communities like Asheville, it's many more hotels right. that, that are there but not showing up on the books. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a big issue, and it will be here if it's not. You probably have some already, but uh, will be something you have to on contend with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, we, we get some in the we city. The mm -hmm. city. Yeah. It's about 12 properties. Any other questions before we wrap up? Well, let's give them a round of applause. And, uh, Thank you. I just want to make some real quick closing remarks. I know everyone's ready to, to go away, but I'd like to thank the partnerships that we have here in Onslow County, the Jackson Onslow Sports Commission, Chamber of Commerce, City of Jacksonville, and all those that, that have worked together, the TDA. I mean, we've made a very, very conscious effort to be a good partner. Mm -hmm. And I think what you showed us today is sort of a testament of all the hard work that we've put in because what well, we didn't talk about the 13, 14 deployments and then the 15, right. when they came home, we recognized, hey, we've got to do something. Things are changing. And that's when we really put our feet on the ground and started really working together. And as you can see, we've been able to get some results. We're headed in the right direction. And today you have validated a lot of what we have already been talking about, but this is sort of putting it on on paper so that, that we can continue our work. So thank you very much for being with us today and thank you for your support. Mm -hmm. thank you. And I guess that'll be all. Glenn? Thank you.